gonna come crashing down. Well, I'm starting to make a conclusion that the time to act is right now. Absolutely. Let's go. You know, something is right in the world when John Schlitt is back in the desert, kicking up dirt and rocking our world. This is the CCM Legacy Cast, and this is the John Schlitt interview. And it starts in five, four. Again, my name is Chris Gaines, and this is the CCM Legacy Cast. I'm here with my good buddy and friend, Mr. Scott Golden. Scott? Hey, Chris. How you doing? Are you buddy? ready to rock today? I, I can't tell you how excited I am about this show. It, it, this is one for the record books right here. So uh, get ready. I, it's going to rock. I got to break down that music just a little bit. That was a little too much. But, uh, yeah, you're ready to go today. It's the day before Thanksgiving, okay? Y- yes. And so what I need to know from you is if you have one plate, you can only make one trip through the line, which probably makes this a fly question in the first place. What is the absolute best things that you're going to put on your plate in the Golden House? Barbecue beef brisket, nothing else. Just a whole plate of meat. That would be fine. That would be a perfect Thanksgiving dinner for me. Why waste the calories on anything? <laughs> well, that's the dead giveaway that you're right in the heart of Texas, is that you're throwing down beef barbecue for Thanksgiving. But I, I can't really argue with that. That's that's pretty good. Well, tomorrow yeah. is Thanksgiving. Go ahead. What were we going to say? But I was going to say bir- birds birds and stuff like that. You can have all that. I don't care. No, 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 no reason to eat turkey. You're I'm going eat beef, beef yeah. all the way. Yeah, all absolutely. right. Well, My father would uh, be proud. He would be, he would be. Well, tomorrow is Thanksgiving, but today is the John Schlitt interview. And it's hard to believe that John is 73 years young and still going strong. No signs of stopping. Yeah. No, no. I, I listened to the Go album this, this morning and it did not sound like the music of a man that's going to be carried over the finish line. It sounded like the music of a man that's going to go out of this world, kicking the door in. So <laughs> I, I really like the rock and roll he was producing at this point. So absolutely, absolutely. With, yeah. Well, with that in mind and no further ado, I'd like to bring onto our stage the one and only John Schlitt. John, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi guys, boy, kind words. Now, now I'm in the mood. Thanks so much. <laughs> Ready to rock. <laughs> Amen. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, there's been so much said and written about this man. So many interviews. His story has been well documented. Uh, we wanted to approach this interview with a fresh perspective and and hopefully the time we have, we can explore some of the stories behind all these milestones. Although we will never be able to cover everything in this initial interview, and we hope maybe there'll be more to come as John continues his journey, we want to give him an opportunity to share really what's most important to him at this stage in life, uh, the lessons he learned along the way, and, and really, most importantly, what he wants to leave behind when he's done. What you got going on right now? Well, we've just finished. We've got one more show this year for the anniversary this year <laughs> i guess it was <laughs> so far uh, but uh, we got uh, a show in brazil on the second and then the rest of the year i get to sort of relax a little bit although that's not true we're going to go in the studio and actually go full force there uh, just a lot going on a lot going on praise god for it because god has a plan and as long as he allows me to do it i get to do what i love to do you know the old case of you never work a day in your life if you love what you do. And apparently, I haven't worked much in my life. Because <laughs> I've been loving what I'm doing. So no. it's, it's, to our, it's to our delight that you keep doing that. All right. So here's the here's the arc, as you will. We've got 1972 to 1980 is Head East. And if you haven't done so in a while, go back and check out some of those tunes. There's some really, really good stuff there. Then there's the Petra years. There's that 86 to 2006, roughly. And mm-hmm. then that comes back in the story here in a bit. 
But in between there, a lot happened. There's damage control. Want to know a little bit more about that. There's the okay. union of sinners and saints, which is fascinating to me with the, the amazing Billy Smiley, who I want to hear from as well, of Whiteheart. You've got the J Seculo band, which again, you had to have found that online. If you're just out searching for stuff, some of the covers you guys did and some of the stuff you did in the studio is off the charts phenomenal. So I want to know about that, what brought that on and, and what, what the plans are for that. Because I want more of that. You did the single, The Fighting the Fight in 2019. And then, you know, somewhere in that whole mix is, is the pandemic, which affected all of us. And so, you know, you had to kind of reinvent yourself and do some different things. You got the solo career, you got the Go album. And then there's the Petra reunion tour that had to surpass everybody's expectations, which may or may not ever end, which is phenomenal. So that's kind of the arc. Uh, and, and probably most important foundation for all of this is your lovely wife, Dorla, 71. You guys have been married this whole time and you guys have four children and probably grandkids, all sorts of stuff going on in Franklin, Tennessee. So how'd I do about the whole 30,000 foot view? Is yeah, that you, you did your homework. That was amazing. <laughs> I, no, I, I mean, well. wow. <laughs> I, can, I can do a search engine pretty well. I can, I can handle the search engine. All right. I was thinking John's thinking, you know, there were some dub awards and some Grammys mixed in as yeah, well. I think, you might want to I think mention we a few of those as well. I, yeah. Hey, with, with all he was talking about, I forgot about those. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, John, let's hit the Wayback Machine. Let's go back to when you were growing up. Tell us a little bit about what your life was like growing up. What, what, what were the things you were interested in? What were your things you were doing? And maybe a little bit about what your family life was like. Well, I had uh, fantastic parents. I have no excuses. Uh, they were loving parents. They tried very hard to give me everything they didn't have, uh, work their tails off for uh, my brothers and I. And uh, uh, basically what I'm doing is I'm building up a, a let you know that my family situation was not bad at all. So any negative that happened in the future was by no means my family's fault. Came from a little bitty town, uh, about 1,700, including the dogs and cats. One of those places where your parents knew more about what you did than you did because of the word of mouth that every little old lady would tell, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Hated sure. the town, wanted to leave as quick as I could. And then when I left, <laughs> when I, left I missed it, you know, so... One of those towns where every parent wants your kids to grow up in, but every kid yes. doesn't want to be there. Yes. And then I went to University of Illinois. Okay. I started as an aeronautical astronomical engineer until the space program collapsed. And I saw them pumping gas and delivering groceries. And I said, okay, I'm not going to go through this discipline. <laughs> <Not gas." laughs> so I well, cha changed to a civil engineer because okay. it was more, more general and got a degree in that. And the day I took my last final exam, I came back in the band, which I had discovered between my freshman and sophomore year called Head East. Joined that band that summer, and it went from a little sock hop band to a major college bar band, I mean, almost instantly. And almost went out of school my sophomore year because of it. Uh, <laughs> Had to quit the band twice okay. before before the end of each semester. And the second time I quit, I said, God, I, I can't do it, guys. I promised my parents I would get a degree. And when I get a degree, then then I can go back with the band. They said, oh, well, by that time, we'll be too big. And I said, you're probably right. But apparently they weren't. And so the day I took my last final exam, I sat my senior year. I joined the band that year, that night. And uh, long story short, through a lot of different changes, we actually went back to the core of the band that I left. Okay. I left my change, and that was a guitar player. And uh, shoot, two, two, three years later, we did our own record on a little bitty label, and it exploded. And uh, it became a classic, uh, an album called Flats of Pancake with a, with a song on called Never Me Reason, yes. which, is, which is a rock classic now. And it was, it was a, a real thrill for me. I mean, that part of my past was, was fantastic. It was a musician's dream. Couldn't think of anything cooler. Only problem is it, you'd be surprised how, even if it's your dream, if you have it every night, it can be, it can end up getting boring. And so 
as we were touring every night and some of the biggest shows that were happening that time, you look for that next exciting part of that evening. Yes. And I'm afraid first it was booze. Then it, then it, I progressed into cocaine and ended up, that's sort of dictated what my day, day was about, uh, how much coke did I have? And the booze was never a problem. I mean, backstage in the secular rock system, I mean, beer was water. You know, water yeah. wasn't cool yet. You know, they, yeah. you could still get it out of a drinking fountain. You didn't have to pay $10 for a bottle. <laughs> uh, so beer was pretty much the the water, of the, of the in my case, of the, you know, backstage. So. Uh, that well, that was when it started going downhill. Well, let me ask this because I, I want to get to that, and we want to spend a lot of time on on that. But there's there's two things that you have just revealed to me that I want to explore. One is to be in aerospace engineering or civil engineering, you had to be pretty bright growing up. Can can you tell <laughs> me what what was that like? I mean, because obviously you had to be able to get the grades. Did it come easy to you? Did you find that uh, you had to study a lot? Because I don't no. know, the story that you tell is, is almost no. like Brian May from Queen. It's like, you know, uh, astrophysicist or rock and roll guitar player. I'm, I'm really impressed that somebody has the, the talent from these, you know, from two, you know, doubly blessed, if you will. What, what was that like growing up? College was just always in my way. You know, I promised my, <laughs> parent, I, promised my parents I would get a degree. Math and, and science was always just fascinating to me. So that was my saving grace. I mean, uh, math and science was no big deal to me. English, ooh, ooh, uh, I was so glad to get out of English courses. Finally, th- made that those credits, and I go good. I can live now. <laughs> math, and science, math and science was just pretty much always just a easy thing for me. And I'll be honest, I didn't work hard in college. I should have. My yeah. freshman year, I did because I was scared. I was, you know, I was told, oh, the freshman year you're going to flunk out. Oh, I don't want to do that. So I actually took it seriously, got decent grades. And then from then on, sophomore, like I said, I almost I had to quit the band twice to, to do the old last two weeks of total cram to save myself. Okay. And and you know, just I just was never that big a deal to me. I just went in and got my degree and and then went and did music. Well, let's Which, let's talk about the voice, because I mean you you've got this beautiful, blessed voice. I mean, it's 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 incredible. When did you realize you had something special there? Uh, you know, junior high, high school, what was that like? And, when okay. I was five years old. Really? When I was five years old, yes. I was in kindergarten. Yeah. And all the, the grades were, you know, satisfied. I got an S plus in music. Okay. And I was the only boy that got an S plus in music. And that meant you were perfect. So I figured, well, if there's something, something about me that must be good. And ended up singing solos for every every grade from then on. You know, the two classes yeah. get together and we do a we do a choir type of thing in between. It, it, anyway, I was always a solo guy there, and it just came easy. It just wow. I hate to say it, it sounds training? like I'm a really lazy guy. I only do stuff what's easy. Well, <laughs> yeah. it takes a little bit of time, but but basically, I just sort of followed what, and I didn't know this at the time, but you know what God pretty much had conditioned me to do, I just sort of flew it, you know, fell into that. I'll tell you what, the only reason I sang, I sang lead in my bands is because nobody else would. Really? Okay. <laughs> I wanted to be a guitar player, you know, and, yeah. and when I started my band in high school, nobody else would sing. So I had to be a rhythm guitar player and sing. And okay. it just so happened that it came pretty natural again and when I went to college, I, I closed that band down in high school and then ended up singing in another band, I ex- in a frat band, and they were looking for a rhythm guitar player that could sing. So I went in and started playing rhythm guitar and started singing, and they had a big meeting, came back and said, first of all, our lead singer plays better acoustic guitar or you know rhythm guitar than you do but you sing better than our lead singer. So <laughs> we're going to switch things around. You're going to be a lead singer. Don't play guitar because it's terrible. I said, okay, great. Thanks a lot. <laughs> and so that was the beginning of me being a lead singer for bands. That's, that's how well, it worked. Let, let me ask you one more like early life biographical question. Obviously you met your wife at a very early age. She was um, my sweetheart. Yep. 
Yeah, t- tell tell a little bit about what was, that was like when you guys first met. What was what what is it that you found attractive about each other, and how did you guys get that instant? I got to believe it was instant attraction. So, well, maybe tell us a little bit not, about that story. I mean, okay. Well, see, she's a year younger than me. Okay, and back then in that little town, oh, you didn't fraternate, you know, fraternize with the younger their kids. You know, you you only went with, until you go to high school, right? And then and then the guys realize, oh. All the good-looking girls of your class get swallowed up by the yeah. guys. So I'm thinking, okay, I, I I started checking out all the girls who were coming, and always thought that she was a cutie pie. I mean, always, but you know, she's younger than me. I don't fret. Well, now I learn. Okay, you find the cutest young lady you can in the next grade, and you go for it, John. And I did. Good. And, <laughs> It just so happened that she's also a really smart lady and all that important <laughs> stuff that sort of came along with the with the beautiful package. And I was just very blessed. I was very blessed that uh, it worked out that way. We went together for six years before we got married and all through high school and college. And just uh, it was it was from God. Absolutely. In fact, in fact uh, just before the wedding, uh, I had to sell my Corvette. And that was a that was a major oh, deal. Wait, oh, wait a minute. I need wait a minute. I need a minute. Uh, I need a minute here. Just just stop right there, Chris. And I'm thinking, okay, now do I really want to sell this Corvette? And a little voice go, you know, a little that go, maybe if I pat the suitcase, put it in the back of the vet, and just took off. And all of a sudden, I'm serious. I think it's the first time God ever talked to me. He says, John. Don't you even think of, that's the stupidest thing you could ever do. Yeah, and it was like, okay. And thank you, Jesus. I've never regretted a second of it since. No. Well, one thing that I, I was thinking about as I was looking at your biography and kind of trying to picture what things might have been like, I've got to believe that with all of the, the challenges you've gone through life, your wife married one guy and probably – probably has lived with three different guys or four different guys over the course of your career and, and, and who you are. I'm yep. just curious, maybe you could kind of expand on that and tell us a little bit about what that was like navigating that. Cause, cause that's got to provide tension and relationship over time is, you know, as you're going through some of your changes, she's got to go through changes as well. Right. Well, I think, you know, again, we grew up together uh, yes. in high school and, and uh, college and she knew, she knew what my, uh, you know, how I developed the whole thing. And before I got married, I said, babe, you do know I'm going to be a rock star. <laughs> I did. I said, I don't know what I was thinking. You I'm know, a pretty big deal. <laughs> uh, yeah. In my mind, I'm a pretty big deal. I'm going to be a rock star. And she goes, I know. I know. And I didn't know if she was just saying, it. yeah, 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 you're going to be a rock star. Sure. Uh, but I think she knew that I had that, that, that goal. Okay. Uh, but we both knew it. So music's only going to last two or three years. It's not a big deal. And I'm getting my degree. So then we will settle down and all that. Well, music lasts a little longer than I thought it was going to. Sure. And, and, but we were, con- we, we've been content. Now I will say the first 10 years of our marriage, I was a piece of garbage. I was a lousy husband. I was a lousy father. I was a, you know, I love myself more than anything in the world. And it was, it was not a cool thing, but she was, she was my babe. She she loved me very much, and and she put up with me, and and only through grace of God. I really mean through the grace of God. Right at the end of that ten years, is she got saved, and became Christian. And that was the, that six months she got saved. I was on a binge that led to my down led to me wanting suicide as the answer. Yeah. And when we th- went through that, when when. Instead of suicide, I became a Christian. God had plans. And that was the beginning of a whole new beautiful life that I have tried to spend the last 40 years of marriage to make up for those first 10 years. Because sure. Now she would go, it wasn't that bad, John. Well, yeah, it was. It was. Yeah. I, I know what kind of jerk I was. And so so I've tried my hardest to, you know, we're on a 52nd year and I will spend the rest of the our time together to make up for those first 10 yeah. and and she deserves it. Uh, she's, yeah. she's amazing. Yeah. What about, I know that 
there, there's in the bio, there's like a single sentence, you know, you were fired from head East. Mm -hmm. That had to be, that, there's gotta be more to that story. And that had to be a <laughs> gut punch at the time. Do you mind well, telling a little bit about what that was like, John? I mean, yeah. cause you're, you're at the, you're at a peak, you're, you're way up here. And then you wake up the next morning and you're down here. What, yeah. what, what was that like? It was, it was a mind blower. I, you know, I, like I said, I was lead singer. I was, I was hot stuff in my mind. And what happened was the two guitar players decided to quit. They'd had enough of this perpetual touring and the arguments and the, and they just, you know, your the different personalities and the two guitar players were pretty mellow guys. And, and the other three of us were pretty hyper and we were always arguing among ourselves. And, um, so when they quit, uh, the other two guys decided, you know what? We don't have to deal with John anymore. He does too much Coke. He drinks too much. He's, he's just, I think we just need to get rid of him too. And I remember sitting in the tour bus thinking, well, okay, we'll lose the guitar players. But right now there's a lot of great guitar players, a lot of great bass players that could sing and we can end up being a better band. And so the keyboard player, who's my nemesis at the time, we were always at each other, says, John, I said, you know, Roger, I, I think the band could be better. And he goes, well, you know, John, actually you're quitting. I says, what? He says, oh yeah, you're quitting. You need to leave the band too. I said, what are you talking about? I'm the, I'm the lead singer. You don't lose a lead singer. And he goes, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, you're leaving. And didn't expect you to go that direction. <laughs> well, that was not the direction I thought we were going. And uh, it made me mad. So when I finally got fired, when I finally left the band, I went on this six-month band I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. I, I was creating a new band to prove to them I didn't need them. They needed me more. Well, really, the, it was just a great excuse for me to honestly say drunk or coked up basically 24 hours a day for six months. Wow. And yeah, so you can't do that and live. Well, you can if you've been doing it for the last three years. It's, yeah. it's surprising how you can, your body sort of gets used to it almost. Mm -hmm. And so for six months, I was creating this new band called the Johnny Band. And really, it was just an excuse for me to stay messed up in rehearsal. Yeah. And at the end of that, at the end of that, and by this time, we're, I'm playing in a, yeah, it wasn't fun. Um, but I woke up the night after our anniversary, which I had missed. We had an anniversary party and I had missed it because I got totally blitzed and couldn't find any Coke to sober up with, passed out on the couch and my wife just left me there. Wow. She, she pretty much had it with, the uh, with my routine. I woke up and I'm staring at the, in, in the face of my little one-year-old son and he's sort of looking at me like, Dad, why are you here on the couch? Mm. My daughter, it's in the living room. My daughter and my son are in there playing because Dad's there, you know. Yeah. And I look at my son and a voice goes, you know, you're worth more dead than alive. I thought, you know what? That totally makes sense. So I get off the couch. I sit in my chair. Thinking, oh, I'm not going to use a gun because that would be messy and I don't want my kids to see a mess. And as I'm sitting there trying to figure out what combination of pills would be the quickest and most painless, uh, my wife comes and tests me. Goes, Remember, she's been a Christian for six months. And yes. she tried to tell me about Christ. And I'd say, get out of my face. I don't want to hear about this Jesus thing. You can't have any fun when you're a Christian. So when I'm too old to have any fun, I'll be a Christian, like when I'm 50. <laughs> What's the and, party's over? <laughs> you know, I, hey, I didn't know much back then. What can I say? Uh, <laughs> so, so she taps me on the shoulder and says, John, remember, now this is while I'm trying to figure out how to, and I'm serious as rain. I mean, it was my option. Mm -hmm. And she said, You promised you'd come to talk to my pastor tonight. I said, When? She says, Last night when you were drunk. And I said, I looked at her and said, okay, all right, I'll go talk to your pastor with the attitude that I wanted her to remember that I tried. I had no intention that it was going to ever be any difference. Nothing was going to change. 
except for the fact that I was going to carry through what I, what I thought was best for my family. But I went to that pastor's house with an attitude, and I walked out with the Holy Spirit, and my life changed. It was the beginning of a new life, and a new John in a roundabout way. Did that mean I was perfect from now on? No, 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 no. But I knew then that I never had to walk alone again. I had the God of the universe that wanted to go before me and help me along, even though I wasn't perfect and never would be and not now. But I did learn as, you know, as I got to be something past a baby Christian, that the blood of Christ was shed for me. And for every sin that I ever did or will be doing, unless it was intentional, like playing games, you don't play, don't play games with God Mm -hmm. because you just don't. And I've tried my best to realize since then how gracious, how amazing God is. And in doing that, try to be the tool God wants me to be, no matter what it is. Like if I'm home working on a wood project, I want to be the best I possibly can because that's what, as if I'm doing it to Christ, you know, doing it for Christ. And and that's pretty much how I've lived. That's how, how we've been with Petra. It's how, how, since how real can I be as a Christian? And that means doing your best in all things. And I'm sorry, I'm awesome. getting on a, on a bench here. I ask the next question. I'm- <laughs> <laughs> John, one question I'd love to ask is, let's say that you had the opportunity to go back and give little John Schlitt some advice at 18 yeah. years old. What 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 piece of advice would you tell yourself? What what would you now that mm-hmm. you're you know looking back? What would you want to know? Oh wow, you know the way God used my every experience was a fascinating. For instance, with, with Head East, he taught me how to be a front man, a yes. professional. Um, I don't want, I wouldn't want to change that. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't want to change the five years in between Petra and Head East because I learned so much in the word and it was exactly what I needed to be a professional, strong in the word to be the front man for Petra. Boy, a good question. I, I don't know. I, I, I would say. I, I think you answered it, John. And, and the only reason why I say that is for, for so many people, it's understanding that the, the difficult times in our lives are preparing us mm-hmm. for something better, right? Yes. I mean, yes. and, and if we take that, if we take that, that attitude in all things, when we're going through those difficult times, realizing we're going to be a stronger, better person at the end of this that God can use to do so many more great things. Yeah. Uh, it, it helps us to get through those difficult times that we're going through, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Hindsight's twenty twenty, and you you look back and watch how God works. It's amazing. Yes. You don't know what's going on at the time. And you're yes. thinking, oh, this this is not fair. What are you doing? What are you doing? But then later on, as you see how it was all structured together, you go, Oh boy, God. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. <Pretty cool>. <laughs> Good job, God. I just, you just, yeah. so it's funny you ask that. I, I, I honestly couldn't tell you. I don't know if I'd want to change anything as much as I, as much as I went through the hell of, of the, the drug abuse and that kind of stuff. And the, now I, I prefer not being such a garbage husband to my wife those 10 years, but to, I, like I said, I think we're we're doing okay, and and God has a plan. Absolutely, cool. All right, well, I'm ready now to transition uh, into the fun stuff that I've been looking forward to talking about, and that is the Petra years. Um, let me lay a little foundation, and also start with a comment based on what you guys just got through talking about. Um, you need to know uh, that I'm coming from uh, that's right in my wheelhouse. When I was in, uh, I was probably late junior high when I had my first Petra album and everything started really from there. I had a Petra album. I had an Amy Grant album. I had a second chapter of Acts. I had a Brush Arbor and man, I was there and I was taking it all in. And so you got to understand I'm geeking out over all of this and then actually getting a chance to get involved a little in this whole movement and then getting to do one of John's shows and, and all the kind of stuff like that. So I'm having to fight the urge not to geek out over all of this stuff, but I want to tell you something 
And I mean this from my heart for all the things that you are on a pedestal and a hero to me for, I think being married to your sweetheart for 50 years is what I'm most proud of you for. And as a husband at 36 years, I want to be going strong at 50. And I think no one could leave a better legacy than to, I know stuff happens. I know there are things out of our control and I know God redeems and he has plans for us all, but I just commend men who make go the distance. And so kudos to you, my friend. And that's probably what I'm most happy and proud of you for in addition to all the other stuff. So I give that gift to you at Thanksgiving. Well, thank you. You know, it really, it has more to do with my wife than me. She's just, she was exactly who I was supposed to be with and she understands me and, oh, we don't, it's not like we're, you know, we don't have our arguments. In fact, we have our arguments all the time and it makes life (laughs) very exciting. (laughs) <laughs> but, but thank you. Okay, so I realized your journey with Petra began in 86, Back to the Street album. But it right. seemed like you really burst onto the scene, at least personally, with war, then on fire. And then it just took off like a, a rocket ship with the release of Beyond Belief, one of the most requested videos that we ever had at our venue. And of course, made us all want to be stranded in the desert and hope that John will come by and fix our flat tire and then get us back on the road. If you haven't seen that video, it's a classic. And then also there was Unseen Power. And that was the one that jump-started everybody's fascination with wind turbines. Don't know about that. Another great video. (laughs) But those were the the things that we remember when John Schlitt hit the airwaves and rocked our world. What was that time like for you going from Head East, that that kind of that period of what you just shared with us, to Mm -hmm. I get a call from Bob Hartman. At that point even was, you know, CCM royalty. (laughs) And to say... I really want to talk to you about playing lead for our, for our group. What was that whole rocket ship ride like? Well, I was a big Petra fan by that time. Mm. I mean, when Bob called me, I was already a Petra fan, only because I couldn't listen to music anymore. I couldn't listen to secular music because it just it brought up old feelings. I, I really loved, uh, you know, singing rock and roll. But the only rock and roll I knew about was was the secular, and and that had too many things added to it. So I had to stay away from it. So I stopped listening to music altogether. Christian music was just wasn't my cup of tea. It just didn't do anything for me. So I actually just stopped listening to music altogether and decided that was what was going to be. You know, I, I, music was now out of my life and never to be heard again until somebody handed me a Petra record. So you got to listen to this, you know, just like your old band, but Christian. I'm going... Sure it does, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Man, and, no, I don't know about that. And, and believe it or not, it was it was uh, come join us, and that's not yeah. like a extremely no. rock, you know. No, no. But but it had the structure of mm-hmm. rock. It had great mm-hmm. singers, great guitar players, good. Dr- I just it had the structure of what I was familiar with, and it was such a breath of fresh air. It's like ah. Oh, I love this. So mm-hmm. I became Petrovin. And then I, you know, got the next records and all that. It's like, oh, this is cooking. My my thought was, well, I blew it. I, I There's no way God can use me on that because I was so filthy with Head East. So just, just no way. And, and But I was glad that, that Petra was out there. And, and I actually went to a Petra concert in Decatur, Illinois, and could only stay there for about half half the concert because it just, I was so disappointed mm. with the fact that I could never be part of that. Uh, but then all of a sudden out of the blue, although I will say that God had be, been preparing me for this phone call and that's a long story. But mm. when Bob called, I thought of somebody playing a joke on me because by that time, everybody knew I was a big Petra fan. And I realized after a while, you know, this really is Bob Hartman. And you know, basic, long story short, would you consider singing for Petra? I said, you got to be kidding me. Um, wow. I, I said, yeah, let's do it. And he goes, don't, don't you think you should pray about it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You don't know how I roll, Bob. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll pray about it. Yes, let's do it. No, uh, yeah, that's what yeah. I meant to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah. I, I really appreciate the fact that he was so real about it. And uh, But I knew. I mean, God had been preparing me for this. So when the phone call came, it was like, that's what he was talking about. So I knew a long time before the guys in the band did. Because many mm-hmm. called me and asked me, he says, ah, this is it. So I had to wait for them to figure out it was what was supposed to go on. So, But 
it and meanwhile they're right in the middle of their their live tour the well actually the beat the system tour which turned into the live captured in time and space yeah yeah turned into live, that yeah. Yep. yeah and so they had to go through that before they could really announce you know me and part of the band so i had to be a real hush hush and at that time mm. i was a scheduling it here for a for a mining construction company and i'm going i'm going to do this i want to I couldn't tell anybody you know i'm going i know this is what i'm supposed to do but this so i'm sitting at a computer messing with numbers all day long going i want to be a singer again i want to be a singer but, <laughs> mm, wow but, but that was that was a little bit of a weird time but when bob so, called me and the reality hit I said, God, that that's the 2020. That was a tw- yeah. the yes. hindsight. Yes. And I and I all of a sudden going, seven years head east, learned to be five years in the word. God, that is so cool. Because I knew that that's what Petra would need. That mm-hmm. kind of a strong Christian with a skill factor that that competes with the secular world, not the Christian. Because Petra Absolutely. was never, we were never competing with the with our our Christian counterparts because our Christian family, because we were all in it together. I always felt that I was competing with the, my old friends that were in the secular world. Mm. And that's, that's how I always saw it. And it was, it was exciting for me. I'll be honest. I, I was never content with what Petra was doing at our peak because I always wanted to be bigger than the secular. And the secular mm. were doing 10,000 seats. We were only doing 7,000. And I'm right. going, hey, we're, just, we're, we're not getting there yet, guys. And they're looking at me going, what are you talking about? 7,000 people, come on. You know, and it just, I just, I didn't know how good we had it. You know, it just. Uh, did, did that cause any friction? Did that cause any friction that no, you had this no, vision of that was much bigger? Or were you all able to no, no. coexist? They knew, okay. they knew why. They knew where why it was coming was, from. Uh, okay. Yeah. No, they, they knew why I wanted to sell. I wanted the best for Christ, and they knew it. I mean, I was it wasn't like I wasn't content. I just was very competitive and wanted to – I wanted God's music to be bigger than the world. And, uh, and to me, one of the way was, you know, how many people – you know, how many seats were sold and that kind of – it was trite. It was, hey, no one said I was perfect. Praise God. It's just <laughs> – Well, with, it with that like in- – it sounds like a lead singer, Chris. You know. Yeah, I was gonna say, man. He's yeah, a front man at heart. You know. <laughs> I am. Like, I'm you a lead gotta, singer. With everything going on. What can I say? You got. We gotta have a little alpha male. You gotta have. A little, yeah. So, yeah. Okay, I, this this is off script here a little bit because you you said something that's interesting to me. And Scott and I spent a lot of time talking about this, and that is, so often God says wait, and guys like us have a real hard time with that. Even sometimes a harder time than no. And so here you are, I'm thinking about this transition. You've gone through this waiting period. You've got the gig, but you don't have the gig. You're going into work and that that angst that's building up and just being able to trust God and go, okay, this is going to work out. I'm finally going to get there. Am I finally going to get, this is probably going to get messed up. Oh my gosh, I can't wait. God, where are you in all this? Was that kind of a time of consternation? Uh, Yeah, I actually did call Bob's uh, wife, Kim, uh, after (laughs) not hearing from him for like two months. I mean, I didn't Mm -hmm. really work. And I finally said, well, I, I told my wife, they must have found somebody else and just didn't want to call me. And and I just wanted closure. Yeah. So I mm-hmm. called Kim and I said, you know, Kim, uh, I was like, hey, is Bob there? He said, no, he's on tour. I said, oh, okay, well, this is John Schlitt. And we talked before. He goes, she said, I know. I know who you are. Listen, I'll have him call you. And so he called me like almost right away and said, I said, Bob, I get it. You know, I understand. Haven't talked to you for a while. So I figured... Hey, did you find somebody else's? No, 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 no. We're on tour. I, we just can't say anything. So I said, well, I just wanted maybe you found somebody. No, no, we're really not looking for anybody else right now. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> we're finishing the tour. Uh, and da, da, da. He says, and then then I'll I'll talk with you. I said, oh, okay, cool. So I'm going, cool. You know, it's, it's like. <laughs> it's, 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 You're not backing out, are you? You're not backing out on us now. No, 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 no. no. Yeah. Right, right. Okay. This makes for a perfect follow up question. Scott and I, amongst loving high school football, great classic rock, we are constantly going to these shows and, and listening to the groups. One of the big questions that I have in a situation like that, you've got groups like 
Journey and Van Halen and Queen and Chicago, when they lose an iconic front man and mm-hmm. the band to go on for years and even decades, A, what's it like following such a distinctive voice like Greg Volts? What was that like? And then how do you feel as you watch these other groups when they go through those situations? Journey's trying to go forward. Steve Perry's in, he's in, he's out. I find this guy on YouTube. I mean, do you have some of these feelings? And what was that like for you kind of following Greg and that situation? Because as I look at it, to me, it reminds me a little bit of Van Halen. There's the David Lee Roth years, and I'm showing my age, but, and then there's the Sammy Hagar years. And we're so visceral. We can't, we, oh, you suck and you're great. I mean, there was great, <laughs> there was great music and there's still great music. And so the John Schlitt years of Petra can never be equaled. It looks like they're back again. But I was just curious, what was that like going through the, okay, I'm the guy replacing the guy. And then when you see that happen in other bands, what goes through your mind? Well, I know that it's a battle. I mean, it was, for me, for us, it was no big deal. I, when I, when they sent me. Was that because of the other guys? Was that the way they handled it? Is that why it was no big deal? No, I knew. Remember, God had prepared for me for this, and I knew. So when I when I when they sent me all the CDs or actually albums back then, when they sent me all the albums, the first thing I did was I I checked out who was doing all the writing, and it turned out that Greg hardly did any writing. I looked at my wife and I said, "This is going to work. This is going to work. Oh, absolutely, no doubt in my mind." Did I did I want to sound like Greg? Heck no. Why should I sound like Greg? I sound like me. Greg's amazing. One of the best singers in the country still is, but I'm not too shabby either. And so, <laughs> and and what's funny was, uh, I told Bob, I said, man, I love your beat the system out. That is fantastic. Said, Don't, because it's never, we're never going to do another record like that. I said, really? He said, yeah, two pop. He said, we're going to do rock. I said, well, I can do that. Yeah, I, I can do rock. And he goes, and and then we get our uh, new producers with with John and Dino, which was. Between me and them, it was the perfect combination to take that next step into the direction Bob, I think, always wanted to do. And at that time, Christian Rock could go that far now. Before yeah. with Greg, I mean, you mentioned Rock and you were straight from hell. So to sell a, rec- a, a Rock record back then, you had to do it under the table and hope that nobody ever knew it, you know, although they were the biggest draw in, in the concerts. It still was a big no, no. So when I came in that had lifted a little bit. And so it gave us a little more luxury, although I didn't know I was from hell so often, you know, after joining Petra, it's like, Oh, apparently I, I didn't know it, but I'm a tool of the enemy at all times. At least that's what half the church was telling me. So, but I knew, I knew someone would say, What's it feel like to fill the shoes of Greg Volz? I didn't, I'm not not filling his shoes. I got my own shoes. And with that confidence, and and I don't mean arrogant confidence, I just knew God had given me a piece about it, and that was easy. Now, what do I think of other bands? You mentioned Van Halen. Fantastic change. Major musically. There, there's no comparison. Compa- but I knew, I knew the old singer, and I'm I'm not a big fan of his. So sure. when Sammy Hagar came in, I wasn't that big a Sammy Hagar fan until he was with them. And I go, man, wow, he's a good singer. And so, so good for them. Now the other bands, man, their journey, you mentioned journey, no possible way. I'm sorry. I don't care how much that guy sounds like Steve. I went and saw him live. He may, he may be a great little singer, but I'm sorry. He's not Steve. I toured with Steve. Steve actually used to be a friend of mine. He probably has no idea who I am now, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate him very much. He used to stand on the side of the stage and watch it going, that man has got it. Mm. He's got mm. it. He's a natural. I don't know. Apparently his voice is, you hear all these rumors, but our little guy from the islands, yeah, no possible way. Yeah. Mm. And that's the only one mm. I can think of. And then the, the other singers for Van Halen, when they came in, when they re, when we tried to replace Sammy, mm-hmm. no possible way. It's funny. It's one of the things you hit on is it's more than just the voice or the sound alike. Mm-hmm. You, you have to you have to capture the personality as well. It seems yeah. like right. It, it, and yeah. and if that personality is not there, it's not going to happen, right? No, so, no, no. Um, it, it just 
there was a magic there. And I, I hate to use that word. I, as a Christian, you're not supposed to use that word. But hey, there was just something special. And it was it was a joy to be part of it, joy to watch mm-hmm. it. For instance, also Foreigner, Lou Graham is not, you know, their new singer, I think might be a better singer than Lou Graham, but Lou Graham was Lou Graham. And it was, you know, he actually sang on with us with We Need Jesus. And good guy, good Christian, but he was Foreigner, not this new guy yeah. who was real good, but yeah. was not it. I'm so glad you brought up We Need Jesus. Please go back. If you've never heard the song that he's talking about, go Google it. It is three of the most amazing voices that put together just will take you to another place. It is it is the voice of angels hearing the three of you guys harmonize. And I'm so glad that got a lot of airplay back in the day. And I had forgotten what an amazing song that was. I'd love to see that have a revival. But uh, that had to be an amazing recording with him. Less number one Petra ever had. Yeah, isn't that crazy? That is just yeah, so well, crazy with how that happens. Well, Petra uh, always struggled with the airplay thing. That's a whole nother story of trying yeah. to deal with, you know, the AR guys and getting airplay. And, and you know, we used to laugh at our venue. We'd bring somebody. I, I My favorite is the Bob Carlisle. And I've got all these little old ladies showing up for butterfly kisses, and he just peels the paint off the wall, you know, <laughs> so, singing like Sammy Hagar. And so that was one of the big struggles that bands like Petra had was, you know, we're only going to play the coloring song. And, yeah. you know, there's this massive army showing up, you know, with flaming swords and John's out there leading the charge, you know, and the radio stations are going, can you turn it down just a little bit, please? You know? <laughs> they had to struggle it's, with it's that. It's hard to explain, isn't it? Just, but oh, yeah, you, you, dealt, you dealt with the hand you are given and it actually allowed us to do two or three slow songs every album. And we knew those would get the airplay if we were going to get any. And then the rock songs were for the live concerts and for the yeah for the folks that wanted to have a great time rocking that night. Uh, rock, rock music is a very exciting music for them. And uh, to use it to sing about the most exciting subject to history of mankind totally made sense to me. But uh, to the uh, to the blue hairs that were controlling Christian music, it just it, it didn't work. So we had to live in two different worlds, and we tried to function within it well. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I think uh, I think we did. I think we tried to, to cover both bases and, and do the best we could. I think absolutely. And and to the subject we were talking about as far as the transition and the difference between, you know, the Greg years with Petra and, you know, then your years with Petra, I completely, as a guy that was the target audience, I felt it and I sensed it. I didn't feel like you ever came in and tried to be like Greg or do that or whatever. It was an amazing handoff. And I've told people that before, I've, you know, they talked to me at the, the Van Halen thing. I'm like, you know, there's another thing over here in Petra and they did it well. It's hard to do it well, but I, I'd like to think it's a lot about the people involved, but it's also about knowing who you are and what you want to be. And so I think there's a lot of that transition. So it's interesting that you tell the story about asking who wrote, you know, the songs yeah. and what role, what role that person played. So we could talk a lot about that. Yeah. That's some great stuff. So this is a question I've been wanting to ask you with all the experiences you had with Petra, all the places you went, all the shows you did, something had to have stood out. What if I were to ask you, when you look back on those Petra years and all that you got to do and all you, all the places you got to go, what one or two things just stood out in your mind? You'll say that's an experience that I had no idea God was going to take me to. And I'll remember it may be something huge or it may be something really small, but what stands out to you most from oh, those man. Petra years? So many. Okay. I'll tell you, I'll give you two. Okay. The first one was with Josh McDowell. We were playing in California, I think at the college. And this, this venue was a little different. It was strange to me because it had very, very wide aisles. The whole building was just very wide aisles. And I thought, well, this is, that's a strange uh, structure, but it works. You know, there's certainly not going to be any any plug up when people coming up and down the, the aisles. So with Josh, we would work as a team, Petra and Josh together. And Josh would give the altar call. And we were back behind him, which we always did with Petra. And it was so moving or the spirit was so strong there that when we asked for people to come forward, those aisles were packed full. All the aisles as wide as they were, were packed full trying to come forward. And, and I remember Josh look, turning around going, Oh my gosh. And I just, I remember that that was like, 
That was the epitome of what it was all about. And we had to stop the concert because there was the place we had for people to go forward. There's no way it could, it was, it was gigantic. So, so I remember that as one of the most fulfilling times spiritually, but then on our, on our farewell tour, we were in Argentina and we were, we were going hand in hand with one of the biggest evangelists in South America. And he, he drew large crowds anyway, but he said, we want, we want to break records. We want Petra to be with us. Mm. And so they asked, I said, yeah, oh gosh, yes, let's work as a team. That's fantastic. And I remember we were at the biggest football stadium in Argentina by far, one of the biggest in, in South America, and we oversold it. In fact, if there had been a fire marshal, he would have closed it down. And I remember looking out, and we had, you know, a, a landing where I could go out into the middle and stand in the middle. I stood in the middle looking at this 96,000 people mm. singing singing a creed with me. Mm. And I just remember that going, how many people get to do this? How many Christian bands get to do this? And this was our, this was our farewell. I mean, this was like one of the last shows we were going to do in our career. And it wow. was, it was just a fascinating experience that God let, allowed me to have. Mm. Wow. 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 Something I want to say earlier is that I think another thing that Petra was involved in, I think when Petra Praise and then Petra Praise 2 came out, it was a prelude to the industry shifting gears significantly from the style of Christian music yeah. Yeah, we're into in what I call the worship era. Yeah, you guys were ahead of the curve back then. <laughs> don't get don't get Scott started. Scott, don't get me started. Scott will get up on it. Yeah, don't get Scott started on that. Versus yeah. rock and roll. I got a real problem with it. <laughs> but I will say this. I will say this. When our time is up and I'm going through the pearly gates, I feel like I'm going to hear John singing some of those songs from those oh. albums because to this day they give me chills and I just being in a concert, being in a, in a hall like that, I can't imagine what it was like in those South American, you know, just, just feeling like I'm good, man. Take me now. Yeah. <laughs> it's, oh, oh. This is going to be what it's going to be like. And just some of those songs yeah. uh, just usher ushering us into worship. And again, it was, it came early. It was kind of unexpected. It was like, what, what's yeah. Petra doing? And you'd put that album on and you'd be like, oh, my gosh. I remember, it, you know, it ushered in a lot of things at church and vacation Bible school and a lot of stuff. But, I, you know, to this day, if you'll sit down, put some headphones on, turn the lights off and listen to some of those songs, man, it'll transport you. It's it's it holds up so well today. And I can only imagine live. OK, I got two more Petra questions and then I'll I'll hand it back to you, Scott, real quick. I know we've okay. kept, kept them a long time, but it's some great stuff. And I'd love to maybe pick this up again sometime. So we got the Petra reunion tour. It's got to have done better than anybody hoped for. I don't know what the expectations were, maybe a couple of venues and a couple of great, yeah. you know, laps around the, around the track, but it has taken a life of its own. And I don't know if it's going to stop, but the question I want to know is you've been doing Christian music like, like this now for almost 40 years. Mm -hmm. Why do you think so few Christian artists, groups, bands have kept going? What, why do you feel like that the secular artist? keep it going. Why is it different with the Christian groups from your perspective that they kind of just fade away? Well, because secular music is an ocean. Christian music is a pond. It's actually a puddle. As far as the comparison in size, you can have all kinds of fish swimming in the ocean with plenty of room. Yeah. In a puddle, you can only have so many fish to survive. And what that does is it chases the old guys out because the young are coming in to find their place. But with that, there's no depth. And the Christian music scene right now, all they care, you know what, God bless them. They're, they're doing the best they know how, but they've got to make a living. And the only thing that's making a living right now is praise and worship because that, that sells. It's, it's mm -hmm. harmonious to what the powers to be think is supposed to be Christian music. It's very pleasant. It's, sure. it's edifying. Mm -hmm. That's what praise worship is. That's, that's great. But Christian rock and, and 
So that kind of, that was actually designed to be to be evangelistic. And back when we were part of the system, you know, when we were doing our thing, that was that was cool. And mm. people liked that. And it brought a lot of people on. It it paid bills. And that's another thing. That was back when you didn't have the internet stealing everything you had. So it was a whole different ball game. So now it's sort of what's cool now is Praise and worship. It brings in the kids, and that's great. And what's funny is you don't need a band anymore because every church has their amazing musicians and their own writers and all this. And so now every every new record is is some church in Australia or some church in Germany or so, you know, with amazing musicians and singers and writers. And so a band has very little chance to survive. There's just a few of us. And Petra. We grew up in a different world. Praise God, the writing, Bob's writing is timeless. I was very blessed to be able to sing those kind of songs. And that's why the 50th anniversary for Petra, Petra was a uh, an event. It was it was something you can bring back in memories. It had and the folks that come to our shows now remember the amazing time as an evangelistic team that worked together. They could bring their friends that weren't saved. And half the time their friends walk out as part of the family again. Those were fantastic memories. So for us to do, we're, we're discovering now uh, that uh, our crowds, they're, we're selling out and it's all friends. I just look at them and say, wow, it's been fantastic 50 years, hasn't it? And just, uh, you know, because of you all, we get to do what we've done. You chose to listen to us. Thank you, my friends. I call them family. That's why mm -hmm. any any show we do, anybody that's at our concert, as far as I'm their family, because they want to experience what we went through. Although there's a whole lot of new family that uh, weren't, <laughs> weren't alive at that time, so I have to mention them too. It's just a beautiful thing. I mean, seriously, when we first started, I figured last year I thought, well, if we do – six shows it'll be worth it you know yeah. six shows came eight shows came it was like okay and then we started about halfway through and we had eight shows all oh, right eight shows that was fantastic but then we find out that we already already had signed up for like 16 other shows next year i'm going wow that's that's different and then that that increased and so this year has been amazing and next year already is starting to build up again so I'm just, I, I praise God for it. If this is what God wants and he allows me to do it, praise God. Why not? It's uh, yeah. a beautiful way to live. It's fantastic. Well, uh, you know, the power of being able to pass that down to a generation, I can't emphasize that enough. And it's got to be amazing for you to see that. But it's also amazing for us to, I, I'd already shared it with my teenagers who are now grown and had given me grandkids. And I'm like, come here. I want to show you this. Check this out, man. And we'll be in the car and I'm just cranking fired up. And they're like, what is that? There ain't anything like that on the planet. Where did you find that? I said, no, there ain't anything like that on the planet. So it's got to be amazing for you to see kids and their kids coming and the generations sharing what you it guys did. Every time I see a young person who's there's no possible way where they're alive, when we first came out, I says, I want you to know I'm so happy that you're here. I said, you guys are the leaders of, of, of your generation. I'm so glad you're listening. The music's timeless. I hope you enjoyed it. Get inspired like your yeah. parents were with us because yeah. you're the leaders of, of, of the, your generation. It's awesome. Okay, last question, I promise. It's okay. interesting that you brought up Bob, but the Petra story is not complete without talking about Bob Hartman. <laughs> this seemingly quiet man has been the mm -hmm. backbone and arguably the cornerstone of contemporary Christian rock music. What do we need to know about Bob and how has he affected your life? Very intelligent, very godly, uh, went to seminary. His, his basically his songs have always been pretty much Bible, Bible lessons, in fantastic rock songs. I've been very honored to be his friend, very honored to be able to be his voice. I will never take that for granted. And it is just a real thrill to be his friend. He's a great guy. He is very quiet. In fact, in fact, he actually talks now on our show, in our shows that he, and I will say, you all should feel very honored 
<laughs> right person I've ever seen. And he actually wants to talk to you tonight. So please welcome Uncle Bob, the storyteller. <laughs> it's story time with Uncle Bob. Everybody gather around the fire. He hates it, but I do it anyway, and we have fun with it. It's it's love. How, how much longer does he want to keep doing this? Hey, we were done 20 years ago. What do you mean? How much longer? <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. You know? The only reason we started this was Bob called me and said, you know, John. It's been 50 years. Maybe we should do a couple of, if there's anybody out there wants to, maybe we should do a couple of concerts. I said, buddy, I didn't know you played. I didn't know you played anymore. <laughs> and he goes, you know, I'm out there still being with all the different things I do. And, yeah. and Bob is starting the musical part of churches and stuff uh, yeah. with his wife, who's a fantastic keyboard player. And I just didn't think Bob was interested in that anymore. He goes, well, you know, it's Petra. We probably should do something, celebrate 50 years. I go, okay. And then it exploded. There he and, goes. And I'll tell you what, it took him a little while, just as it took mm. me a little while. But man, he is cooking now. He's just got his got his fingers back. He's just, he's Bob. So, so awesome. It's a, it, if you get a chance to see him, you should. If nothing else, you should check out Petra because of Bob, John Lowry, Greg Bailey, is who's our yeah. bass player now, and Christian Barnio, who's our yeah. drummer from Argentina. Those four guys are some of the best musicians in the world. And wow. just to watch them mm. is just a thrill. It's just, just fun. Mm. Cool. Uh, J- John, let me ask, because we're, we're getting to the end of our, our interview, and this has been – I can't tell you how much fun it's been for me, and I, I know Chris has had a great time, and hopefully you've enjoyed it as well. I love it, guys. What one of the things that we we want to focus on just as, as we kind of close things out is what is it that you want your legacy to be as as you're beginning to wind down what's going to be your life? Hopefully, you get a chance to look back and go, "This is what I want to be known for." What so what what would you want to be known for to your family and friends? Uh, that I'm honest. Uh, that uh, that I've made it clear that I'm not perfect. I blow it every day. Only by the blood of Jesus Christ can I, can I really call myself a Christian. That I, I so much appreciate the fact that God chose to allow me to do what I do, uh, despite the fact that I don't deserve it, never have. I don't know why God has allowed me to be who I am, done what I do. And I, I just want everyone to understand that I appreciate it more than words can ever say. I, I, I hope I hope that people will realize that the God we that Petra has been singing about that I've been able to be the lead singer for is for real mm-hmm. and that that we have made a difference in the reality of Christ to man. You know, and that's Christians and non-Christians. I want Christians to realize that their God is for real and they have a plan for them and don't let the world try to chase that out of their hearts. And for the world that has not had a chance to experience Christ yet, why not? Oh my gosh, you got a God of the universe has a perfect plan for you. Why are you trying to do this on your own when you've got a God who wants to go before you and allow you to reach that perfect plan he had for you before the beginning of time? I hope that is a legacy that people can read from me. Absolutely. I, I would say one other legacy is somehow God created a front man that has a humble servant's heart. And that is a miracle in this world, John. I, I, I see I see both in you. Okay. I really do. I see I see this rock and roll lead figure and I see this humble servant of God. It's a yeah, wonderful it, picture. It, it's it, a it, beautiful that's thing. Not- that's not supposed to work, is it? No, no. <laughs> arrogant jerks. Okay, okay. I can do that. Wow. What, wow. What's What's next for you, John? Just final, final thoughts. Where, where, where's where's well, the next couple of years? What are you trying to accomplish? Okay, right now, I've got several irons in the fire that are all important to me. The Union Center of the Saints with Billy Smiley. The J, J. Secular Band, which is very important to me. Of course, uh, my solo record, Go!, I want to tour it, but I don't have any time. Uh, <laughs> uh, Go actually is my is the oldest new record I've ever had. Thank you, COVID. Thank okay. you, COVID. Yeah. 
Yeah. It came out right when COVID came and I had to shelf it. And it's been sitting in my basement, actually in my garage for three years. And it's still an amazing record that's never had a really a chance to be heard. Yeah. Um, I would love to tour it. These are my recent goals. But I will say that as you, as we said before, the, the Petra 50th anniversary took over everything. And if that's what God wants me to do, praise God, I'm certainly not going to complain. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll make a mark on the calendar next time you're somewhere close or anybody that's listening, go get tickets, guys. It's a great, uh, a great ticket. It's a hot show. You'll have a, a good time listening to it. So if people get a hold of you, the best way to do that is through the website, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, okay. John W. Schlitt dot, dot com dot org john schlitt.com i think we've owned, we own every john schlitt thing we can get <laughs> good good because garth brooks took all mine and that's a whole nother story but that's- for a while man i didn't have i had to go buy them all so it's like right thanks, right guys. right right so it looks like on the website that you actually can hear some of that music you actually put some of that up yeah. there is it we can I listen think, to it i there? think i put it all on because i didn't want anyone if if you want to hear the record and you like it, I, the whole song, each one of them. That's Just awesome. listen. And if you feel that that should be part of the, your repertoire, please, please join. Just come in. Now you can get it through all the other things, but I okay. wouldn't mind you. Yeah. Cool. Hey, real, real quick, g- give me just a, a paragraph on this is phenomenal to me. Tell me what the, the thought process was, this house concert concept. And have you done some of them? How's that been going? Oh, love it. Billy and I realized that the Union Center Saints were too expensive ever really be sold because a band is all eight artists from nashville and we have to have top dollar for them and so we said you know what these songs are amazing with with jason fowler who's the third member of this little team we have two acoustic guitars three singers and tracks and we yeah. do petra stuff whiteheart stuff jason stuff which is amazing he's he's an upcoming artist that should be heard by everybody isn't yet but will be and then we do the Union of Sinners and Saints songs out, out from two records that are all great. It's But we tell stories in between songs. And mm. Billy's stories with White Hearts so amazing. And they're different every, you know, new stories every every tour. We're doing a show in May. I'm looking forward to it because just to get caught up with the guys and uh, just have a, a fun time. It's, it's rocking. I mean, believe it or not, acoustic guitars with tracks, you can rock. But Absolutely. it's also it's also intimate and it's it's a fun time. It's totally different from anything else I do, and I love it. So I, I don't talk enough about it because again, Petra's sort of at the. Top <laughs> but but I mean, they, people can contact you in, in any from forty to four hundred any venue. What a yes. perfect way to create an intimate environment. We uh, we actually some, played we actually played in some people's backyard. living room backyard. Oh wow, that was that would yeah, be so cool. cool. And that That's was that so was very cool. unique. And that that was the whole thing. Let's make it very intimate. If if the you know if they can afford our costs, bring your make it a family reunion. We don't care. Right. Uh, it was it was to be available for a lot smaller crowds. And uh, again, it's sort of like when I did tracks a long time ago. Mm-hmm. It right. was for people that couldn't afford Petra, but they could they could at least have <laughs> Petra stuff. And I gave up. That was us back. That was us back in the day. And it was <laughs> it was awesome. We packed it out. We had to turn people away. And he blew our speakers up. Man, that was incredible. <laughs> it was incredible. It, it was fun. And but now yeah. I don't want to do tracks anymore. I want to have a little bit more uh, a little bit more to offer. And and that's probably the the smallest I would go now with this the yes. three piece yeah. with the acoustic and tracks. Yeah. And it really is a fantastic evening. That's awesome. And you've also got a Christmas album. We got the holidays coming up. Yes, I do. do. And I'm very excited about that record. I mm. love that. Record. I did it what, people... six, seven years yeah. ago, and I still love it. <laughs> it's your new old album. How can people get a hold of that? Can they go to Spotify? Can they download it? Can they? All of it. Yeah. It's called All the Christmas Project. You can get it uh, uh, anywhere music sold uh, on right. the internet. Uh, I, you might even get a few copies in in bookstores if they even sell CDs anymore. But mm, uh, Christian bookstores uh, that that was that's a blast from the past. I, I don't know if they do that anymore. But but where you, where music is sold, you can get it. With that in mind, I actually have a copy of your little drummer boy, and we're gonna we're gonna go out. Our show's gonna go out with a bang with John Schlitt and the little drummer boy. John, thank you so much for making time. This is I can't tell you what exciting thing. I got my pleasure. Christmas gift early, and uh, we'd love to have you back if that's okay sometime. And please, 
go check out the website. Go see him. If he comes anywhere near your town, please do. And lift up he and his family in your prayers during this time. And the God will just continue to open up opportunities. Bless you with good health, my friend. Keep rocking. Good to see you. Absolutely. Thanks again, John. Amen to that. Amen to that. With that, we say adieu. And John Schlitt and the Little Drummer Boy.